episode 57 of Strange Brow Radio. I'm your host again, Tobe Johnson, and today you've tuned in to a very unique and special broadcast with our guest Sean Mooney, who is a real-life Indiana Jones uncovering lost civilizations, perhaps, in the Pacific Northwest, the incredible concept of pyramids in the Pacific Northwest. I've been to one of these supposed pyramids, and I'll tell you more about it in a second, but Sean is going to do a whole lot better than that, so in a moment, Sean Mooney. But again, thank you to the sponsor, Feral by Aaron, Etsy.com. Go to Etsy, E-R-Y-N, Feral by Aaron. Merchandise uh, has flying out for January, February, so get it now while it's hot. All right, we'll be right back with our guest, Sean Mooney. Tum Tum Mountain sits east of Longview, Washington. It's been home to Native American powwow meetings up until recently, and it was underneath the shadow of Tum Tum Mountain where great rituals were performed, not only by Native Americans, but by maybe a civilization that has yet to be talked about. What if there is a pyramid in Washington State, right off the Columbia River Gorge. And it's right under our noses, for lack of a better word. These are things that I I read about and heard about back in the 80s. And I had, well, just by chance, a moment where I was actually underneath Tum Tum Mountain as a at-home insurance health uh, provider of sorts. I'd just go in there and to clients' houses and uh, they were spread out throughout Washington State and do quick medical assessments for insurance companies. And one of these was underneath what I knew was Tum Tum Mountain. Now, this is where Sean Mooney comes in because as a, I believe, a real-life Indiana Jones, he's looking into all sorts of mysteries related to possibly three pyramids surrounded uh, by the Cascade Mountains next to the Columbia River Gorge outside of Longview, Washington, which is also uh, an incredible story in itself. It's an interesting area just to drive by and look at. You get that feeling. And then with the added bonus of the stories out of the town of Yak Holt, the stories out of Lewis River, incredible supernatural paranormal stories, This is a very interesting area, and if there is going to be a pyramid discovered in Washington State, I would think this would probably be its very home. So, keep an open mind. This is a really exciting episode with Sean Mooney and the Pyramids of the Northwest. All right, I'm here with Sean Mooney. How are you, Sean? I'm very well. How are you? Good. All right, so we got a lot to get through, uh, Sean, and I'm excited to talk to you about the work that you're doing because it's an area I'm somewhat familiar with, and maybe the audience is as well. Um, if it wasn't Art Bell bringing Red Elk onto his radio show, I may not have even heard about what is called Mount Tum Tum, and that is where our story begins, but it's by no means where our story is going to end at all. So um, before we get there, just give folks a little bit of background on who Mr. Mooney is and how he got so darn inquisitive about... Uh, what okay, no problem. No, no problem. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, so so my background, I, I grew up in Longview, Washington, which play, pays a, plays a really key role in my research. Um, Longview, Washington was created by a bunch of really industrious men and put there in a really specific place for real specific reasons. That plays really high into my my research. Uh, Tum Tum Mountain specifically, I think, is one of the you know most prominent of the ancient sites or ancient structures that are in Southwest Washington and 
sure stands out. I mean, visually, it looks like a pyramid. You look at the geology report, it it um, shows a, a geopolymer construction of its massive angular blocks that is 68% silica and 31% quartz. It's, it's a pretty amazing structure. You look at how it's connected to other structures and sites in the area and see how the, the, that whole area is surrounded by a water flow. And it's, uh, it all just becomes really interesting to see those sites and then how they're connected and related to the development and migration uh, patterns that have always affected that uh, part of North America. Okay, so you grew up in Longview, Washington, and from that point on, you you heard rumors about a place like this as a young man. How did you? So, so when find I was out? a kid, yeah, when I was a kid, you know, my grandfather was a member at the Elks Lodge, and my other grandparents were, um, you know, members of other societies and and things that of that nature there in town. And I would hang out at the lodge with my grandfather when I was a kid. And um, they taught me how to bartend when I was really young. And so I would, I would do um, classic cocktails and, and the, the older people would just tell me stories and, and tell me things. And most of them I, I thought were just, you know, complete stories. An old person that's been drinking would tell a, a young person that's making the drinks. But as I got older and I started to notice the architecture of the city and, and some of the correlations of the stories and what they were saying and how they were related to the actual architecture of the city, one of the specific things that they told me was that there was a seal of protection and growth that would um, accomplish guardianship on the city. And so they told me my, my grandfather was a, an accountant for one of the big companies there in town. And so they always told me, hey, your grandfather's really smart. And, and you, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll be able to understand this certain math. And, and when you're older, you'll, you'll be able to decode this code and, and, and decode this seal. And so that always kind of stuck with me. And, and growing up, it, you know, my, as I got older, I started, to, as I said, notice the architecture and notice some of the numerology especially in the the way the streets are arranged and some of the uh, people that have been immortalized in the streets like washington or olympia the mother of uh, alexander the great that emboldened him to be be the great and take over the world and how some of these streets come together and the way the numbers of the streets come together and some of the symbolism that they represent it, it started to become kind of obvious what section of the city mm-hmm. these people were talking about and so then with that then of satellite maps and uh, apps like Superimpose and, and things that allow you to do some, some pretty amazing uh, stuff just right on your you know handset cell phone. I was able to decode a lot of the the math and the symbolism and as I as I sent you earlier you know come up with what I believe holds the code of the city and the seal and its really specific geometric arrangement and how it's related to. Uh, Masters of architecture in the past, Da Vinci and artists like Blake, and mm-hmm. and going back to you know structures, a great pyramid, and and all of these structures and works of art that are coded to the same code that's held in in this city, and, and a lot of it has to do with the the ancient question or riddle of Vitruvius, and that's how to square the circle. And so I noticed that right away, of course, Da Vinci's answer to how to square the circle is the Vitruvian man. In uh, Vedic astrology, the answer to square the circle is the Sri Yantra. Uh, you can lay those images together and you see that um, the overlay is very specific of the geometry of how the triangles will overlay the man and the points of the chakras and where they'll align. So you can see there's a real direct relationship in, in that specific geometry. And so I noticed that those two geometric images, classic, of a uh, very specific growth architecture. You know, the Sri Yantra is, is classically said to, you know, increase the increase creation at the point where it may be uh, laid on the ground. So I started to notice a lot of correlation in what these people had said and these this geometry and what it was said to do. Mm-hmm. So then by the superimposed app, you can see that the the two things they overlay and the congruency of geometric relationship is, is, you know, more than just a coincidence. So, right. so you can see those two simple, simple uh, forms of geometry are, are meant to overlay and, and then answer that question of, of Vitruvius of, of, you know, how to square the circle. And so 
looking deeper into that, I, I see a relationship of these classic masters of architecture and art, where they're trying to create in the image of the creator who's creating in his own image. And so there's a, there's a resonance in that, a, a harmonic resonance when the creation that's been designed has been designed as of the creator. And so there's a, a real trick to that. And, and there's a lot of mathematical tricks in the way these codes of structure overlay or how they're meant to be uh, an inverse image overlaid on top of them. And then how inverse images would then be aligned to the architectural points that, that have been outlined by the anatomical structure of, of say the Vitruvian man or other um, anatomical icon representations that have been structured in the same way of that coding. Right, now, hold well, hold the, it right there for a second, Sean, just for a second. Um, yeah. This is a huge data dump, and most m most of the people who are listening to this here will be rewinding. Yeah, a lot of confusing. will be rewinding yeah, yeah, this to sorry, listen. Yeah. To, but no, no, you yeah. got the. You did this all before age twelve. <laughs> I assume it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, My, here cool. I am. I'm sitting back on a beanbag trying to get high score on Mario Brothers one. And you're <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. answering the riddles of the universe in Longview, Washington. <laughs> well, 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 I'm 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 noticing that certain yeah. men have tried to answer those uh, riddles of the universe in Longview, Washington. Is is, is really okay. what's well? What's let's going let's on. Go, yeah. let's go back there uh, to the beginning and the founders and work our way sure. out to places sure. like uh, Yakult and Tumtum yeah. and try to understand yeah. what it is about Longview. What, how they chose it, Why and what, what, well, and what yeah. they 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 saw something besides access to timber and a, and a waterway, right. because that, that's right, all right. over the interstate of I five North and South. So, what was it? Yeah. Uh, what is the truth of the matter? First of all, and who is your grandfather? It sounds like your uh, grandfather was inducted into some kind of secret school besides the Elk Lodge. Is that? Is that what we're talking about? Well, you know, I, if it was, it was secret and it wasn't ever, you know, it wasn't ever expressed to me in any way. He was, you know, other than the Elks Lodge and being a member to to take advantage of the golfing and, and that he was the, now he was the accountant for the Long Bell Corporation, obviously started by R.A. Long. Right. So he was the head of accounting for the corporation while he was there. And, and you know, he was, um, you know, very astute at, at math and mm -hmm. and he was very known in the city for, for math. Now, you know, he made mention to me multiple times and, and drives around the town, you know, and did different things that, that I'd be astounded if I knew what was under the city, if, if I understood what this all meant. You know, he made, he made multiple mentions of, of things like that. But to my knowledge, I, you know, I, I didn't find any regalia after he passed. I didn't, I didn't find anything linking him to mm -hmm. any orders other than his association at the Elk Lodge, which, you know, seemed very, very normal. Uh, he was he was the CFO for the Elk Lodge, you know, with his background uh, during a time. Um, I remember going there and, you know, like I say, he was a, he was a, a boss of, amongst the people there at the lodge. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, he was in the town. He was very smart and mm -hmm. and uh, in charge of a lot of the numbers. So, you know, that would make sense. But to mm -hmm. my knowledge, it's, um, you know, mm -hmm. that would just be me guessing at some type. Right. Did you ever uh, find out what he meant? I don't know. How it works. Yeah. Did, did you ever find out what he meant about what was under the city? Well, you know, that's another rumor of Longview is is that, you know, there's so many rumors there and, and because of the way it was it was put there and, and some of the sites that were taken taken out, um, native sites that were taken out to for Longview to be put in place. Uh, Mount Coffin Burial Mound, for one, you know, was the largest burial mound on the entire West Coast and on the Columbia River. At the time they bulldozed it and turned it into the streets of Longview. There was three thousand burial canoes. Um men all exposed with their arms crossed, uh, mummifying in the sun. Uh, the, the industrious men of Longview decided it would be good to bulldoze those men and uh, that, that mount and turn it into the concrete, then they turned into the seal of the city. So there's a lot of, 
you know, ne nefarious acts that you can look at as how, how are they done ritualistically? How, you know, what's the geometry that plays in this, in these rituals? You know, what, what did take place? It's, it's um, really hard to say. There's, you, you can look at the historical characters that Ari Long, or Ra Long brought to Longview. The, one of them was uh, Billy Sunday, this uh, super, super charismatic preacher who would get everyone worked up in these spiritual uh, 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 group meetings in the town center at, at these points of, mm -hmm. of ritual um, geometric specific locations and he would get the whole town worked up in these frenzies of, of uh, spiritual activity and, and um, so, you, so you look into some of these things that are going on at this time they, they talk about you know, you, you see how they talk about uh, utopian scientists doing um, experiments of trying to create utopia. And that's one of the things that, that seems to be apparent in the, the layout of, of Longview is uh, like our capital, Washington, D.C. My, my friend Robert does a, a ton of work on, you know, this, this same very similar layouts in Washington, D.C. and these these uh, points of anatomical placement that are ritually important and specific to the, the layouts. And, and so you see a lot of correlation in um, the capital city and Longview, Washington, and a lot of the architecture is laid out mm -hmm. in the, the same way for the same reason. So you, you see all this correspondence in this little tiny city where three rivers meet. Um, you, you can see the way that the Columbia River as it flows to Portland, Oregon is flowing west like it should to the ocean. And then for some reason at Portland, Oregon, it decides to take a 90 degree right turn and flows all those billions of gallons of water north mm -hmm. all the way to Longview. And then it decides to take another right turn and head back west. And so, you know, there's that little area dictates, if, if you look at migration patterns over history, that area of the Cascade Mountains running parallel to the coast, and then the, that little area of 45 miles of where the Columbia River runs north and south there, that, that dictates a, a very strong migration pattern that mm -hmm. has become the I-5 corridor. You know, that's, that little area dictates the entire I-5 corridor by the way it runs. You can look at satellite maps and, and see that it's no coincidence that the, the I-5 runs directly on that path all the way from Canada to uh, Mexico because of the, what the river and how the river flows there between right. the mountains. You can, you can look at historical and some, 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 you know, there's arguments on, you know, what was the nature of the bridge of the gods on the country? River and, and what, how did it actually exist? What was it actually a structure of, or how did the Columbia flow through it? Um, that area is directly linked into this area of ancient sites that I'm looking at um, around Tum Tum Mountain specifically, mm -hmm. Green Mountain specifically, a mountain in Stabler, like not really finding the name of, but it's right in Stabler, Washington, then Silver Star Mountain specifically mm -hmm. at the center. And then how those structures are geometrically related and the relationship to the river and how the river flows through that area. Okay, let's talk about Tum Tum and sure. get, to, get to why that's such an interesting geological structure. Explain sure. to people why it's... And, 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 I don't dis, and I don't disagree that there, that there may be uh, quite a bit of geothermal activity in that direct spot. My take on on this on this specific structure at Tum Tum is is directly related to uh, mineral mining or um, or uh, or uh, the extraction of precious metals, specifically gold. If you look at the way Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams spew on a regular basis, especially Mount St. Helens, you know, erupt on a regular basis and pull all of the elements and, and everything that they, they, they spew from their volcanic activity into the, the water structure of the, the watershed of the Lewis River that then flows to the Columbia and then to the ocean. You can see both of those volcanoes specifically shed all of their material into that watershed. And so there should be a massive amount of uh, you know, precious metals. And uh, one thing my grandmother always showed me is, is, is that, and that there should be a ton of precious metals in that area that, that are, are missing. You know, the, those volcanoes are regularly erupted. They're regularly throwing, you know, precious metals into that watershed. That watershed should be loaded with precious metals, but, but it isn't. They're all missing. 
so if you if you douse the that top the top topography of that area you'll see that those volcanoes throwing their metals into that water and then the way the water flows down to the the lewis flows to the columbia there's a big corner right there now my buddies all dive for gold in, in alaska and that's what they're always looking for is the big corner because that's where the, the heavy metals will fall out to that big corner by specific gravity so if you douse the watershed to the big corner there used to be a giant waterfall at the big corner which has now been replaced by a dam then a little bit <laughs> west of that dam you'll see a, a really interesting little creek that jetties back east back up against the mountains, but it's been cut into a very deep ravine to be able to accomplish that so that the water is able to flow east. Mm -hmm. So one, I find that highly irregular that there is uh, uh, you know, a honey hole gold uh, pot right on the big corner with no gold there, then uh, a flow stream flowing back against the mountains that's been cut into a deep ravine to allow the water to flow and wash out the gold directly in front of Tom Tom Mountain, which I, I believe is part of uh, an extraction and refinery system of, of this uh, work on this heavy metal. I, I believe that they, in the past, in ancient times, they used uh, mercury for uh, what's called collating gold or using its, its uh, molecular uh, power of uh, the two heavy metals wanting to unite. And so by gravity, it, you know, the old, old system very simply explained is if you pour mercury into a stream where there's gold, the mercury will attract the stream again to that big corner. And so you, you can just pour mercury into a stream and, and then the gold will collect, right? And so I, I believe that's, there's a very strong evidence of that going on at Tum Tum Mountain. Uh, they have the prairie right next to them, and on the on the exact due cardinally aligned side of, of the structure is what's called the Chalatachi Prairie. Now I see that word as phonetically linked to the word Kalatin. If you Google both words, you see that they are the same word. So there's the Kalatin Prairie and the Kalatin Creek running cardinally aligned to the next store of the structure. Mm -hmm. so then you go about 25 miles north, directly north directly north to the town of Cinnabar, which Cinnabar is the ore that mercury is refined from. So then you look at the history of, of the, of the uh, migration of uh, Western civilization to that area. And one of the anomalies that pokes out right away is that one, the Native Americans named the town Yakult after a, a demon that would come and take a healthy man in the night for no reason. So while it's a beautiful area with what would seem to be amazing natural resources and somewhere anyone would want to live, it's always been cursed as a little town of the demon Yakel. So if you look at the extraction process of the Lewis River flowing to the honey hole at the dam, collected up the flow river, refined through the pyramid structure or, or, or an adjoining structure close to it, again, that's, that's where this refining may, may be linked to some of the geothermal activity. And, and this may not be a, a pyramid that was built as a, as a block structure, but maybe a geothermal site that then was uh, altered in its, its uh, structure to emulate the, the geometry of the pyramid for uh, industrial uh, reasons. And so if you trace the waterways, you see that there's a really unnatural waterway that flows right out of the back of Tum Tum Mountain as an industrial waste the stream and flows directly into the town of Yakul, giving it a complete explanation why people are sick there. So when the Western settlers moved there, a couple things happened. 90% of the settlers that moved there died right to that area, completely as an anomaly, never, never researched to a point of explanation, to, of, uh, to a satisfying point of explanation to me that has always been an anomaly as well. So then you also have the, uh, the I'm sorry, my phone is ringing, so it made me lose my train of thought. Oh, that's I'm very okay. Sorry, I was getting no, another no, call. No, Hopefully that's, okay. that's not buzzing on your line. <laughs> so then, if, <laughs> the little town of Yakul, you have, you have the wastewater from this industrial mercury collation of gold flowing directly through this quartz crystal structure that does show geothermal activity. So I believe that the, the, the mercury is connected also to the event that's known as the Yakult burn. And so the settlers that moved and migrated to that area 
not only were they affected by this massive uh, unexplainable medical anomaly, but then there was a what's been explained in, in some of the, the texts that I've read as a supernatural fire. And no one really understands why the initial blaze was started or, or why it ran in the pattern that it ran. Mm-hmm. So the, this fire was explained that some of the articles that I read were settlers leaving in their in their uh, wagons, running from exploding pine trees that are exploding, uh, you know, uh, it, it, completely 200 foot trees that are exploding with fire. And then they're fleeing this this event in their in their wagons as fast as they can. And so I've been able to um, with the satellite maps and imagery and the technology of today, I've been able to take the old maps of the Yakult burn, and then um, I sent them to you today, and you see the Yakult burn is in the maps I sent you are represented in the pink um, of the diagram of, of the area, and then the connected sites that right. I think that are linked, I think that are linked in, in what I think must be channels of, of mercury being used as a superconductor to, to link these sites. I know that sounds, you know, considerably, so it's a large assumption to make, but, but what I'm saying is that you can see the obvious trail of the fire following the obvious connected sites that I say are linked by some form of mercury. And so this fire, when it occurred, did it have something to do with the mercury? So you can see in Mexico City at the Pyramid of the Sun, one of the most recent discoveries in the, in the last couple decades is a massive pool of mercury found at the bottom of the pyramid and all the, the signs of the fire uh, that has happened to the Pyramid of the Sun and to Tehuatihuacan. Now, one very interesting thing is that the, the Tehuatihuacan Pyramid is in layout of that Mexico City site is exactly the same as Tum Tum Mountain, and you have the exact same locations, almost point to point. Specifically, the Pyramid of the Moon is is the mm-hmm. most apparent, of course, and the and the um, you know the, the Avenue of the Dead going from the Moon across the Sun, and, and and to every single point is pinpointed in the same location, and it is uh, just a lot larger. You know, the Tum Tum Mountain is 844 feet. Tall, so it is exactly four times the size of the Mexican pyramid of the mm-hmm. sun. So there's there's a direct relation, even the correlation of its ratio to its geometric design. So it's let it's me very ask you that, let me ask you this real quick, Sean, about the fires. These are sure. these are things that Brian Forrester is uncovering too. That there is some kind of cataclysmic melt on a lot of these megalithic structures that looks like so 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 my great. buddy so so specifically to speak to that my buddy is uh brother umar of the washita people of the moore society of america so these these people are uh the washita tribe has been suing the federal government since the 50s saying that no they are not african americans of the slave trade they they are indigenous people of north america and so so Umar puts out a Pyramids in America uh, book. And so phonetically, he's taught me a lot of, you know, their language and its lineage. And, and one of the things that I find so interesting is the word pyramid and, and his phonetic uh, interpretation of it is pyro as for fire and mid as middle or the fire in the middle. And so when you look at it from that phonetic interpretation, and then you look at the evidence that's being found in these structures and the use of mercury and what seems to be going on in them. It, it shows that what Umar is saying, the fire in the middle, I say, got out a lot of times in a lot of these structures. Okay, so they were, there's fuel and said, I suppose it, there should be remnants that you can test for large mercury deposits in the Mexican pyramids and the pyramids up here. Yeah, they found a hole. Yeah, if you look into the Tehuatihuacan site, they found literally a whole pool, a large, massive pool of liquid mercury directly under the Tehuatihuacan site. Okay. And so the practical purpose of using mercury, in your opinion, was to separate and find the gold? Well, I think for multiple reasons. Mercury is such a un uh, has so many uses, right? It's a superconductor if it's if it's mm-hmm. cold enough. It it will it's a heavy metal that will collate other heavy metals um, in organic uh, streams or you know in organic systems like a stream or mm-hmm. 
you know, there's a lot of things mercury will do and, you know, there's a lot of things gold will do. And there, there's a lot of things that I think using the two and using mm -hmm. uh, massive amounts of, of energy, there's, there's a lot of, I guess, alchemic processes that, that we've kind of, you know, lost and, and went away from that style. And of course, you know, we've gone into on and through other technologies and, and now we're seeming to, mm -hmm kind of we're seeing a kind of a resurgence in looking into some of those old technologies and we're seeing it being expressed in, in new technologies. So it's it's very interesting to me to see the cycle and epochs of, of human uh, uh history and, and migration and how it is affecting that specific area for sure. Okay. So with Tum Tum itself the, it, I just invite everybody to go on Google Earth and type in Mount Tum Tum and you'll see for yourself. Yeah. It would help you more yeah, to actually it, uh, yeah. dr drive up to this place. And um, sure. early on in the beginning of uh, getting out of the service, one of the jobs I did was do mobile insurance exams near Battleground, Washington, which brought me underneath the shadow of Mount Tum Tum in this prairie that you're talking about. And when you're sitting below something that looks like it, is right out of Giza. Um, it has yeah. attri attributes to it, including what appeared to be cornered sides. So let's talk about what we're ab able to study and look at that matches pyramids of places like uh, Mexico and Egypt. Uh, you were mentioning too that there was perhaps quarried stone that doesn't belong right there. Is that correct? Well, sure. If, if, if you look at the, you know, I, I sent you a couple of the excerpts from the geology report. One, if, if you just look at the molecular composition of the what's stated as angular blocks of massive size and that they're of specific white dacite uh, uh, rock or crystal, uh, I, I, I'd say rock. But when you look at the molecular composition, you're, you're talking about a, a, a rock that is 68 percent silica. So glass. It is 31% of its overall makeup is quartz. It has two magnetic ele elements that um, have that function at two separate magnetic wavelengths. It has a host of, of almost exotic um, metal oxides. One of the the uh, fer ferrous or iron oxides is is listed as not being found in nature, only being found in the use of of uh, the uh, production of scientific glass. So it's it's very interesting to me the 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 composition of of the makeup of these blocks the a uh, couple of the other anomalies that the geology report states is that it is completely mantled and they use the word mantled in this dacite and that it starts like every um, classic ancient structure we see with massive angular blocks at the base going up to mm -hmm. what ends up to be shards of almost dust of crystal at the top. And so it's, it holds a lot of um, other anomalies in the geology report. It's stated it's the newest volcanic or volcano in the Cascades. It's stated it's the smallest volcano in the Cascades. It's stated it's the most, most Western volcano in the Cascades. It's stated that there's absolutely no fluff or um, irregular uh, elongation by glaciation. It, it, so what it's saying is that it, it, it's a completely solid unit of almost pure glass that is completely symmetrically shaped as a pyramid and that it is perfectly cardinally aligned and that it is uh, perfectly symmetrical. It, it, it multiple times it states that it, you know, symmetrical, it, how mm -hmm. symmetrical it is. It multiple times states it's triangular shape. It's, um, there's even an excerpt in the, the one part where the geologist is trying to determine whether some of these massive angular blocks that, that are in an a outcrop that, that goes for, um, I believe it says 100 to 150 meters of uh, whether they were caused by a landslide or it says, or transported. So then he goes on to do a, a magnetic uh, study to, to try to substantiate the the, you know, the, the, the how and the where and the why these blocks are the way they are. Mm -hmm. And his magnetic study in the 80s, and there, to my knowledge, hasn't been one done since, his magnetic study in the 80s proved that the structure was all aligned to the current magnetic pole system. 
So I've seen, and I'm not an expert in this, and I, I you know, I make the assumption that this could be relevant to why that occurred. Is is that this structure may be older than the, the current pole or the current magnetic um, pole alignment? And so, if that structure was there when the pole changed, then the structure is and its uh, design and molecular configuration has allowed it to align to the current magnetic um, alignment. And so. And I've seen, I've seen, you know, different tidbits mm-hmm. about that. And, and like I say, I'm not an expert on that, but, but I do feel that there's a, you know, there, there's something there that, that uh, he was looking, he, this geologist, and he doesn't say that anywhere in the thing other than transported is the use, is the word that he used, you know, to, is quandary of why the blocks were like that. Well, and that, so, impli- that mean, implies that somebody did it when you use... Somebody moved like, them there, right? Yeah. And that he wants to know why. And it says that they're massive angular blocks. And it Sean, says that has, there, some- has there been any proper, in your opinion, has there been a proper geological study or dig or investigation not, into this? The only, not, not since the 80s, as far as I can find, other than just recently... Um, I've been finding this document that it's out on the, they are assessing its value at for field spur. And so in other words, they are looking into the geology, geologists and uh, I'm sure corporations are looking into the value of this crystal quartz on Tum Tum and what they can do with it. And it really worries me that, you know, that, that, that it will show, you know, this, it will show that it's mantled completely in this quartz crystal and then corporations will have a chance to you know grind that into silver and we mm-hmm. could we could lose we could lose one of the you know the most significant unfound sites on the planet right. due to you know quartz paper chips or, or whatever they decide to grind grind this is not a, this is not a national monument by any means you drive by this no, and you dismiss it because there's no sign at all about this yeah. Well, it's, it's it's hidden in plain sight, right? I mean, you hate to use that term, but it is absolutely hidden in plain sight. If, mm-hmm. if you look at the corporations that have owned it over the past and who's owned the title of it and what's been done with it and the things that are connected to it, it's it's astonishing. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like fears and theorists, but the companies that have owned it all have very nefarious, uh, directly linked to long view uh, okay. ties of of you know companies that are are uh, very very large and do uh, you know do very very bad things with natural resources. So Let's go. Yeah. Think. Well. Yeah. I used to be a truck driver out that way. You can see that sure. it's the sure. number one place for exporting uh, all sorts of stuff off the Columbia. No, one, with- one thing that really. Go ahead. Well, I'm sorry to mean to interrupt, but before I lose the train of thought about, you know, like you're saying, why is it not marked? One thing that used to occur at, at, in the Tum Tum region was the Tum Tum powwow, right? So the Native Americans in that region have gathered for thousands of years at the base of Tum Tum Mountain to, se- to celebrate it as a sacred site and hold a gathering of all tribes of the entire West Coast for thousands of years. And so why it holds no no protection or any significance is is beyond me. It is it is astonishing to me that it is hidden in plain sight. If you ask if you ask most people in Washington, they have never heard of it. They have never mm-hmm. seen it. Like you say, if you Google it, it stands out like a sore thumb. Uh, they they tried to hide it with logging. The logging industry, in my opinion, hide it. They have, they have planted trees on it three different times, and and now the trees won't grow because there isn't enough nutrients between the blocks. And <laughs> right, and it's, yeah. a, it, it's totally hilarious because if you, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. It, there's just an yeah. empty empty mountain with yeah. uh, a trail right. going it's up. The wind, and, the wind, the wind is exactly the wind will expose it now unless they grind it to field spar. So <laughs> it, the wind will expose it as a pyramid within the next 20 years. I, I would imagine maybe for, you know, I don't know the wind erosion rate, but, mm-hmm. but it's, it's clearly Mount St. Helens and, and Mount Adams ash that is covering it from the blocks to the organic material that is growing in it, mm-hmm. that organic material material has been uh, completely used up in the way that it won't grow evergreen mm-hmm. trees any longer. And so now the wind will uh, strip, the ash from the blocks and mm-hmm. soon enough it will poke itself out it's it's uh <laughs> it's going to be a pretty amazing sight i mean okay. you just look at the composition it's white crystal blocks shaped like a pyramid so if the ash goes away whether it's a pyramid or not 
it's going to absolutely 100% look mm -hmm. like a pyramid. Right. Now, I, okay, I want to ask this specific question here because I don't know if I heard you right or if I didn't hear you at all. Maybe I didn't ask the question right, which I'm probably going to do throughout the interview because you're incredibly well versed on all this. When looking at the pyramid from far away, satellite view, or even going up to the, you know, we're calling it a pyramid, but let's just call it an sure, interesting sure. site. Yeah. Does it have yeah. uh, geometric angles that align to other geometric angles like you would see on a pyramid as it corners off? Yeah, of course. Yes, okay. of course. It is It is 100% four-sided. It is 100% square at its base. Uh, the lidar images show that it's it's not protruding through the mantle and coming up as a as a volcanic uh, intrusion would, or uh, what it's okay, doing. Okay, well, well now hold on, that's see. that's that's huge. I mean, that should change I know. everything. <laughs> you can that, see I, it that does. fact right there that should be did. the point of transition from skepticism to now, who built this? I mean, that should be the question. Uh, yeah. Well, it's one of my questions, that's for sure. You can see from the LIDAR that it sits on its on its the land, you know, it's not mm -hmm. coming up through the land. You you can see in, in some of the LIDAR images, you can see the mm -hmm. way that ash is actually in some of the areas on the north east right. side, you can see right. it's, it falls a little bit out of the geometry. But, so but a, what a you cinder see, cone, like a cinder just to explain to people here real quick, a cinder cone, explain how the difference between looking at a cinder cone on LIDAR which is ground penetrating radar, right? When you're combing over right. the surface. Okay. Yep. So explain the difference yep. between, because this is what you'll find is that this is a volcanic mole hole that is billowing up. Right. At, then, you, at a then, tip. then you'll see like a, like, like I hate to be graphic, but like a pimple, it, it will come up and through the skin. Whereas right. this, this you can see is clearly sitting on the ground around it. Okay. So there could be chambers just like any other pyramid, correct? We would imagine we we would imagine that mm -hmm. it is um, because it's of its advanced construction and the nature of its blocks and how uniformed and its size it, it must be of advanced design on its interior as well. I, I I could not speculate at all what what the inside of this would look like. I can see that it is specifically linked to the other structures around it in the exact same correlation mm -hmm. as the layout of Teotihuacan and Mexico City. So I would imagine that the structures would have similar attributes as those structures. They, they're, they're obviously, they hold the same geometric pattern. So mm -hmm. the structures themselves, I would imagine, would hold the same functions and a lot of correlating uh, structural geometry. Okay, so it's not just sitting someplace just because. Explain to people no. why 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 it's sitting where it is and what it aligns to and how why that's important. Well, one of the things you know, you can look at, at history and of of that area, and and you know, like you mentioned, the the, the timber barons stripping the timber, and the you know the uh, Trojan nuclear power plant, and why it sits where it sits. And, and why the why the Cascades cross the Columbia River right there at that intersection, and why the the Columbia River goes north from from Portland, Oregon to uh, Longview, and what what kind of you know for lack of better word energy vortexes that that creates, and how how that entire area is surrounded by flowing water, and and what that does to the uh, you know the energy and how that energy can be manipulated in that specific area it's it's all very very um uh, correlated to why the why the structures are there and in my opinion the tum tum while it while it is so um you know you, you see it and you're just like oh yeah that's a pyramid. you know no one no one, anyone i show the picture of they say one i've never seen that before and two i can't i mean yeah that's a pyramid so what i think is tum tum and green mountain and the site at stabler they they, they are on the outside and of this connected circuit area of, of that's connected to the main site in this area is Silver Star Mountain. And so Silver Star Mountain, it holds the perfect geom geometry of a cardinally aligned star that's perfectly situated between Green Mountain, Tum Tum, and Stabler, which which are all dacite structures and all all hold I I irregular uh, square bases and center tips and you know every, everything that you find at uh, Tum Tum Mountain you find at the other sites exactly to to the T the cardinal alignments the same materials the same same everything and so then 
when you just draw simple lines of uh, connected, you know, you one, the three pyramids, they make a gym, gym, the, their geometry holds a, a perfect triangle. The two base pyramids, Green Mountain and Stabler, when you mm-hmm. dissect or connect them together, that line directly flows directly through Silver Star Mountain. And when you look at Silver Star Mountain, you start to notice that it's it's listed in Wikipedia. Had, had the reason I found it is I was looking for anomalies in the Cascade Mountains and and volcanic anomalies specifically. And when I looked up Silver Star Mountain, it had a question that stood out to me. It was lots of odd. And then it, then right away, it's made of the same dacite that that Tum Tum is made of. Well, that's really odd, and that it holds perfect cardinally aligned geometry of a star in the mm. center of this area that I'm looking at, it really started to seem odd. So I, I, I started to research uh, Vedic astrology and, and different long cycles of time and, and different uh, constellation um, connections because on the western arm of the, the Silver Star Mountain is, is a large monolithic rock that's known as Sturgeon Rock. And so this monolithic rock is, is massive. Um, I, I don't know the actual dimensions, but I, I know when I look from satellite maps and I look at the road going by it, it's, you know, in comparison to the perspective of the road, it is a massive, massive structure. And so Sturgeon Rock is, is the, holds the exact geometry of the overlay of the constellation Pisces. So there's five points on the Silver Star Mountain, the westernmost, being the Pisces location in the sky of, of Sturgeon Rock is holds the perfect constellation overlay. And then it also holds all of the artistic representation of the Sturgeon. So, and you think about in the history and ancient uh, migration times of, of people crossing the Columbia River and seeing these you know, mystical uh, sturgeon that were you know 20 i remember growing up in longview seeing pictures of sturgeon on log trucks you know i know my great grandfather caught a sturgeon in in kettle falls waterfall uh before there was dams on the river that was 16 feet long so i know that these people they 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 looked at those sturgeon as a as Mm -hmm. a very powerful and um you know very Mm -hmm. mystical uh beast in their environment right and so i i can't believe that Perfectly aligned on the perfect arm of a perfect star mountain is a perfect representation of, and I hate, I hate, I hate to say that many perfects, right? Because that always sounds like, <laughs> oh, I'm trying to make this right. There's right. a lot of perfects, right? And right. that's not what I'm trying to. But all of these things are true of the geometry of Sturgeon Rock being an artistic representation of a mythical beast of the region that has been cardinally aligned to the western arm of a star mountain. Now let's think about that sturgeon itself. Now, if it's, if its head is going towards the east, it's running parallel up the river, you know, in parallel to the river of the Columbia, like it would in a fertilization pattern from the ocean to, to where it's going to spawn, right? So that's significant to me. If you're on Silver Star Mountain and you look out towards the Pisces representation at Sturgeon Rock, it's the highest ground until you get the ocean to the ocean at the west coast so when you're on the star and you're looking through the fish it's you're literally if you could see the whole way the next thing you would see is the ocean so the fish is literally coming out of the ocean up the river to the west on again perfectly cardinally aligned on the western arm of the cardinally aligned star mountain so when I look into Vedic astrology and what they call the cycles of the yuga and the long cycles and how they're tied to the constellations, I started to look at the star mountain and I started to notice that, man, it's not only Pisces as Sturgeon Rock, but the location and uh, uh, chronological order of the constellations would be Aries beneath it. Well, sure enough, you can absolutely see that, again, Aries is clearly marked by geometry on the the uh, southwest uh, arm of the star. And so is Capricorn on the north, and so is Leo on the east, and so is Taurus on the southeast. So all five points are at the same altitude, the same distance to the center, and all hold very specific geometric correlation to constellations that are in the order as they are in the sky. And so, and in uh, when I look into the Vedic astrology, that's exactly how uh, a Vedic 
mm-hmm. uh, time device would work. You would stand on the head of the Pisces, looking into the into the night sky of, in the east, watching the actual constellations go by, triangulating their coordinates through the center of the star and finding out time-space positioning and mm-hmm. uh, short and long cycles of, of, of where we are actually at. And um, it seems to be functional. And so the fact that there are three very anomalous crystal quartz, pyramid-shaped, absolutely symmetrical structures in perfect geometric relationship to a cardinally aligned star calendar with a very clear denotion of Pisces on its um, uh, clock position is is very interesting to me. I, I find it highly uh, irregular uh, to the to the topography of the of the region that it's in. None of it has been glaciated or elongated. Everything else around it has, and those structures sit uh, perfect. So to me, it's it's very curious. Yeah, and all this you figured out by the age of fourteen. And so, bravo to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not that. It's not like that. No, no, no. I, I mean, had a, it's I just... had a lot of I had a lot of background and <laughs> hints from people, and then with the advent of satellite maps and and these these new superimposed apps, and then you know, my I, I do have a, a you know a, a very um, substantial visual gift. I I, I do have no. The I'm ability. Looking, I, just so people of, know, I'm just flicking you shit here because of the fact that it's so what you're giving is such uh you know encyclopedia and and, uh i'm looking at the silver star mountain star overlay that you gave me that points out what you just explained here yeah and things are just oddly specific especially when it comes to the spacing between yeah look at the the look at the look at the altitude look at the altitude every one of those every Mm -hmm. one of those points is at the exact same altitude and distance to the center of the star okay so this and look at okay so now look at look at sturgeon rock okay now Uh drop down to the next position where aries is right and you see how look at the tip of air look at the tip of the nose of aries is in the jaw and the ear and look at it running up the hill it's yeah. it's, it's it's geometry holds as specific as does pisces okay so it's, let's get out of let's true. let's get out of the realm of speculation here because now you have you have sure. hard you have hard data with lidar you can see that tum tum for example is sitting on top of a surface is not a, a pimple or a syndicone squirting out of an old volcanic site so we we know that, but yet we're turning a blind eye to the data. What about the natives? You said that they went there at one time, and they would have seasonal, um, you know, traditions. Yeah, they would have their powwow for thousands, thousands. You can you can Google the Tum Tum powwow, and you'll see that for some reason they stopped it in 2010. Thousands of years, and just for some Wait. reason it just stopped in 2010. Wait, that recent? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's very okay. anomalous. The, uh, also, you can uh, research the Lewis and Clark involvement with Tum Tum. Okay. So the very first place that I could find that the the, the friendly natives and mm-hmm. uh, specifically uh, a chief of the uh, Chinook, uh, who I believe is very involved in in kind of this story and and, and understanding some of this is is King Kamkali of of the mm-hmm. Chinook Indians and and um, some of the traditions of of the Chinook and the Cowlitz Indians and mm-hmm. and uh, specifically the elongation of their skulls and the work I'm doing with Marcia K. Moore and this this connection to to how the you know you Peru you long headed people in the sites there Egypt mm-hmm. long headed people in the sites there guess what Washington State long headed people and the sites are there it's there's a very strong correlation to this elongation of the cranials by indigenous people for a specific reason uh, one specifically tied to that and it's just an assumption but the word tum tum is in the, in, in the indigenous language there is is in relation to the word heart and so to me it's a phonetic uh, example of tum mm-hmm. tum or you know tum 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 it's a magnetic oh. sig- it's a it's, it's a oh. magnetic signature Wow, I'll never, I'll never okay. think of the mountain the same way again. But let me ask you real quick right, here the about the the, the founder of the the founder of Longview. Before we have to go to commercial yeah, here, sure. I, I want to ask you okay, about. No um, you said Ra R A Moore, but then I heard you say Ra Long, yeah. Ra Moore. Ra, well, 
Yeah, I say that just because. I, I mean, mean raw, no, long, not was, more. Raw, yeah. yeah so, long, are you, yeah, yeah. Well, but now, was there any kind of appreciation? Is there an for implication the fact, that they well, were worshiping the sun in an Egyptian mystical manner? Yes, of course. Look at the seal and and the and the and the graphic symbolism that it denotes. There's there's a scarab at the bottom of the seal with its mm-hmm. wings, and that scarab I've I've used my Sky Tracker app, of course, to to authenticate that scarab is following the path of the sun. Like I don't know if you know what a dung beetle or a scarab does, but sure. if, if you take a circle of sand, right, and you place a dung beetle on that, it'll push its little dung ball to the path of the sun every single day, right? And so you can you can use that scarab to to track the sun in helical worship or sun worship. And so at the bottom of the seal of Longview, clearly in the in the graphic is is the scarab with its wings on the path of the sun on no other day but the winter solstice. It's um, not a coincidence that mm-hmm. the, the the layout of the town is is you know after Eg- Egyptian mysticism. It's it's um, all of that is connected to those orders of mysticism and their geometric relationship and geometric ritual and mm-hmm. and, the, and the power that it has once it's expressed in a, in a design. And this wasn't just a bunch of Freemasons getting together. To, you, know, you know, I think that's a on. really overused term, right? I think mm-hmm. it's a real generalization of of uh, some orders that get clumped together into one generalization, right? And 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 I, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, it was, most of those men probably were members of Freemasonry, and, and the history clearly shows it were. You know, there, there's every form of lodge is is, is uh, placed in uh, very specific places in Longview, the Elks, the Lions, the you know, in any lodges at a very geometric, um, you know, non-coincidental. I mean, they, they're they're in a spot they're in for the reason they're there, and so there's you know there's a ton of different connections esoterically to orders that have true lineage to ancient knowledge, and and I I think that you know Longview the 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 men that were involved were connected to some very specific things. They they are expressing it in a very specific way and in a very specific plan. The, the numerology is, you know, you see such a hype these days on 369 and the Tesla relationship and all those things. But when you go to Longview, Washington, you see that from 3rd Avenue to 33rd Avenue, it has been absolutely every blade of grass has been designed. There's no coincidences there. Every The numerology of the the base schematic pyramid that makes mm-hmm. up the city center, mm-hmm. the base of the pyramid starts at 24th Avenue because in numerology, two plus four would be six. The Eye of Providence Park, which is at Vandercook Park, if you zoom in from satellite map, it's it's almost eerie. You zoom down to the sidewalk and make a pupil at Vandercook Park at the Eye of Providence location at 21st Avenue or two plus one is three. And then the pyramidal tip and the geometry at the center of this of the Jefferson Square City Center, where Washington meets Olympia at Jefferson, is 18th or one plus eight, or the ultimate number of nine. And so you can follow that numerology as it verifies the codes throughout the streets. It's there isn't one point that the seal will show that isn't verified by that math. It's it's very easy to verify. Um, that because it's such a simple, it's such a simple code. I mean, you, you take, you know, any, any, uh, any part of three, six, and nine, you you count with three, six, nine, the next number is 12 or one plus Mm -hmm. two is three, 15 or one plus five is six, 18 or one plus eight is nine, 21 is three, 24 is six, and so on and so on and so on. And so that, Mm -hmm. that, schematic of numerology rules the city and verifies every location. So you can, you can see that the, that these men were into some very specific order of geometry. And your grandfather probably, it sounds like knew most of this. Well, he taught me a lot of math. I know mm-hmm. that. And he was, he was uh, very well known in the city and he was, you know, quite a character and incredibly smart. And, um, you know, known for it. And so, yeah, I, I, I again, I, 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 you know, have, have no idea because whatever, other than the Elks Lodge, whatever he was a part of was, was a secret. Okay. Let's, uh, let's have you think on this question here. Now, before you answer it, uh, we're going to take a 
a quick little break. But uh, while we're on break, I want you to think about this question. And when we'll come back, I'll have you answer it. When it comes to the weirder side of what's happening in that specific region, there is a legion of stories, in particular, a lot of UFO stuff, a lot of cryptid stuff going on out that way. So when we come back, I want to know your familiarity with that region and those stories, and uh, maybe you have some personal anecdotes. But don't answer yet. We'll be right back again sure. with my guest, Sean Mooney. All right, Sean. So the question before we went to break was regarding the area itself. Uh, geographically, it's sitting below Mount St. Helens, uh, near the Columbia River, north of uh, the Columbia River Gorge, near Hood River, and above Mount Adams, which people have heard me talk about Mount Adams before and all that goes on in the shadow of Mount Adams. Yeah. Um, of course, yeah. Things very that go on, active, uh, right? Active. Let's just go over some of the things that go on in that specific reason. Of course, Skamania County has its own Sasquatch ordinance that you cannot disturb or hunt uh, a Sasquatch. Yeah. And you get near Mount Adams, there's more than Bigfoot going on. There's a lot of UFO stuff. There's the East Seti right. Ranch. There's a lot of local right. legend. So, what what stories do we know? What personal anecdotes do we have of? Mount Tum Tum and that general area regarding the supernatural. Sure. Well, a couple things that, that stood out, you know, real quick that you said, like the Isetti Ranch, and I've seen James talk on uh, YouTube videos about native leg legends of crystal white pyramids that, when the natives first arrived to North America, if if, if a, a brave had you know fallen in battle, they could they could take that brave to the base of these crystal white pyramids and and then in a couple of weeks later the you know the that that brave would would be healed or, or or show up you know in better shape and and uh i think one of the things and I, i've never talked to james and i've never been to the city ranch and, and I'm, I'm i'm not a huge uh proponent for this being you know an alien or extraterrestrial uh thing i think this is a historical event but i do find it very uh interesting the you know the corresponding story that James has uh, used about these white specific crystal pyramids and the uh, relationship of my site to, to where he's talking about. I, I do think there's a cor correlation there. Um, one thing my grandmother always told me about this specifically, and, and she was the, the person that I was with when I was nine years old, the very first time I pointed at Tum Tum Mountain and said, that's a pyramid. I made her, we, it was 1979 and we were coming home from Harry Truman's resort uh, the year before the Mountain Blue and my grandparents were good friends with him. We'd go up there every year and, and, and spend a bunch of time camping and we came down that way this time and, and when we were driving by, I almost think my grandmother prompted me into, hey, Sean, what's that or something? But, but I don't know, but I, I said, hey, grandma, that's a pyramid and I, and I was upset about it because they wouldn't pull over. And, and let me go check it out and in the RV. And so I specifically remember that event uh, really specific. And so one of the things my grandmother always said about this, um, you know, she, she talked about the, the long heads and, and the connection to sites and, and the connection, like I mentioned earlier, about the, the missing minerals and uh, elements of gold and, and, you know, what should be in the river and what the mountains should be putting there. And, and what she always said was her, her feeling was that it wasn't uh, an alien um, interaction at all, that, that her, her true feeling was that it, it had something to do with uh, pe people or, or entities from, the, from our uh, direct future. And, and um, I don't know what to think about that either, other than that's what my grandmother said was involved in this. And um, I guess, you know, if it's aliens or people from the future, I... I honestly, I, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, you know, an opinion either way. I just know that I was with my grandmother when I first saw this site. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was, um, you know, a, a big background influence on, on the way I see things, the way I see them. And uh, it was something that she mentioned. So. But Native oral tradition talks a lot about the sky gods and it talks about beings under the, under the ground. And is that yeah. any different when it comes to the natives that were in that area? You know, I don't think so. And, I, and, and again, I think this is, is like epochs of time, right? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, 
periods of of growth between cataclysm right so it's like you know humans get to get to have a golden age uh for a period until something strikes the planet or a cataclysm uh, occurs that wipes out civilization so what's interesting when you look in that area is you have the elements to for for civilization to survive those cataclysms you have you have the mountain ranges to survive uh, floods and high altitude ground to be able to reach you have in the caves uh, ape caves and laser caves and ice caves and indian heavens those, those are massive womb, what, what they would call wombs of the mother places places for civilization to to hide from events of of fire or, or meteor or cataclysm of that nature there's there's all of those things are are, are built into the top of of that area and Mm -hmm. i don't think it's just a happenstance i I think there's there's a a relationship to why man can survive in a specific way in that region but you you yourself haven't had any personal interaction or experiences oh with sasquatches ufos or ghosts well Um, anything anything that seems like it would be completely out of line with reality well, you know what the things you know, obviously you, you know like you mentioned the density of reports in that area is off the charts. Now, is that related to the mercury that that was used to right. place the gold? Right. <laughs> right? I, I I have specific theories about that. I, I I think that you know I'm not discounting people's opinions of paranormal or or Sasquatch or ghosts or UFOs. I you know I everyone has opinions and I think there's data that supports all kinds of statistics that can can show that there's you know uh, something to lots of things, right? But but me personally, I, I have have never experienced anything in that region that I would have that I would consider mm-hmm. absolutely supernatural. Now I have been out in the woods in, in an area called Rose Valley, Washington. When I was when I was young, we used to spend a lot of time out there. And one time we were up in the woods in a, in a really nice area, and um, you know we saw. Uh, we go up there all the time and, and we see the classic, you see the 12 foot trees, the, 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 the eight to 12 foot trees, they all have their tips bent over and they're all bent over at kind of the same height. And so people in that area always talk about that. That's the male dominant alpha Sasquatch marking his territory and showing the other Sasquatches and the people around how tall and how big he is by bending the tip of these trees that no man could ever reach. And so, you know, I, I've been up there in that area of uh, above Kalama and above Rose Valley and on the way, the foothills and going up to Mount St. Helens when I was young and, and working in the log, logging and I, I did helicopter logging and a bunch of work in the timber industry. And there was always the legends of, of specifically what I said and the Bigfoot and the trees and how they mark their space. And I definitely have seen that. And I have definitely been in the trees uh, with the loggers and heard weird noises and beat it <laughs> out of the area. But I've never seen any, I've never seen anything that, that I could specifically say by fact was mm-hmm. a Sasquatch or a ghost or an alien myself. Okay. Whatsoever. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about things that seem like they might have some connection to something like an sure. alien, the, the longheads, as uh, yeah. Marcia calls them, the the anatomy of them is very curious. Yeah. And for them to be showing up here, really, uh, you know, I could see that being a type of forbidden archaeology. Is that the way it's treated? And what do we know about the the actual you data, know one thing the I facts think is, behind them being there? Well, well, one thing that I think is 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 a universal interpretation by all human beings that that a long-headed individual is alien, right? So why is it that we have that natural interpretation to see that skull structure as alien? You know, that that to me is interesting in itself, that, that there's, you don't need to be told, hey, that long skull looks like an alien. You just look at it and say, wow, is that an alien? You know, so it's, so to me, that in itself is interesting. Why, why we, why we, any of us, you know, that don't have long heads, when we see a skull that's been elongated, why is the first thing out of your mouth, that's an alien? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that to me is interesting. So where does that come from? Is it coded in our DNA that, that yeah, our DNA is recognizing that we are seeing the, the uh, you know, the, uh, what, what simulates or emulates the, the look of an alien? And so immediately we, that's the first thing out of our mouth. That, that to me is highly interesting. 
um, I've talked to Marcia about it in length, you mm-hmm. know, what the, what's the, what's the purpose, right? You know, why, what, what's, why long game? So I think a lot of it has to do with, again, I think that there was a, um, a technology involved in a prior global civilization that has a lot to do with vibration, specifically quartz, how it vibrates. I don't know if you know how the old walkie talkies work, but used to in the oldest walkie talkies, you would have a crystal for Sean and I would have a crystal for Tobe. If I want to talk to Tobe, I would have to put my Tobe crystal into my walkie talkie and you would have to do the same. Now those crystals, they were tuned with a tiny little bit of gold. And so if you think about a pyramid and its pyramidal tip of gold and its encasing of mantle of quartz, really in the look of what those old crystals look like, <laughs> it's the same thing. And so I believe that the quartz crystal vibration can be tuned by a gold pyramidal tip and then wireless communication or resonant energy, whereas if a quartz um, is holding a specific tone and another quartz is holding that tone and the big quartz vibrates, it's going to make a little vibrate to resonate to that same tone or transfer energy wirelessly. So I believe that there's a real correspondence between the elongation of the skull and the reception of these vibrations from these structures and the tuning of those structures specifically by their gold pyramidal tip to their quartz mantled structure. So it, it operates in the exact same way the old walkie talkies do. I think it seems to uh, suggest that that is not a frequency that is so much traveling through the air as um, what they would uh, call uh, subparticle quantum entanglement. So it's very interesting to me that at the turn of the century, we were using handheld devices that employed subparticle quantum entanglement, and it's taken us till 2020 to, to get back to where we're ready to start trying to figure those things out again. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. And then looking back over uh, what is called Coffin Rock or Mount Coffin, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, is that, you sent me some images here of um, what look like burials or exposed burials here of skulls and femur bones and Okay, so that's one of the so that so the, the the picture with the giant skull and the, and all of the elongated skulls, mm-hmm. that's that's a what's called a memelus, an island of the dead that's in the Columbia River just east of the Dalles, I think. Yeah, right in there east of the Dalles. And so that they the Native Americans of the Columbia River, uh, they specifically um, laid their their dead to rest in in visibility of the sun with their arms crossed to mummify in the sun. And so these memeluses, they, they were specifically set up by tribes or different um, orders of men, basically. Like, we're Mount Coffin from everything I can read and everything I heard as a kid. And, and I, I, you know, it's like, again, it's hard to discern these, these legends I heard as a kid in Longview from, from stories that you want to tell kids to scare them to, man, these things are like, you know, this is what it is. And so the legends that I heard about Coffin Mountain was that there was 3,000 canoes there uh, with mummies of, of holy men, either chiefs, shaman, holy men that were, that were um, designated by elongated skull or giant structure. So as a kid, I was told that there was at least three giants in, in giant canoes on Mount Coffin. I was told that almost all of the men on, the, on, on Mount Coffin all had elongated skull. I was able to substantiate that through the... Um, through the work of the Smithsonian because the Smithsonian came and took all of their skulls. And so um, before they, before they, um, you know, turned the rest of the, the mound into the street. And so there's, there's uh, a lot of really particular things going on in these death rituals and these, um, these men being laid to rest in very specific ways on the river. And so that, so that Memelus that I sent you the picture of mm-hmm. where, where the very dark skull you can see is a giant. He's, he's Marcy and I have talked about the perspective of that picture. And, and it's, it's, you know, you see the size of that skull and that skull is probably 10 to 12, you know, we're estimating feet behind the skulls that are in the forefront. And, you know, photography, anything in the forefront is going to appear larger than mm-hmm. anything in the background. There's that actually, skull there's, yeah, there's in actually, the background appears. Yeah. It appears three times as large as <laughs> right. any of the skulls. If, you, if in you're the looking foreground. in this photograph off to the left side, there seems to be one about the same size that looks 
uh, much more elongated. Uh, and yeah. Maybe it's because yeah. it's a profile it's, it's, shot, but uh, this one almost appears. No, you can. It, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh-huh. You can you can look at this at the work at the Smithsonian, and especially you know my 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 favorite char- my favorite historical character back to King Kamkali. He he was the man, and so you can see they they took a very in depth. They toured his skull around the world because of its elongation. They, they, you know, they took a very in-depth study of of him and and um, you know why what they they had no idea I don't think at the time of why these people were doing that practice. And again, I think it ties into the way the uh, frontal cortex and the uh, visual cortex. Um, I, I think it's, it's by changing the way the, they align and the way they're situated around the penile gland, you, you get um, a very added uh, increase in perception. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the things historically noted of Konkali was how smart he was and his, his um, magnetic personality. And, and another thing that was noted about him that I think is the lineage of the Khans, like say Genghis Khan, is he always had a, a daughter on tap to make a trade with, right? So he, he had a do- he had a wife in every tribe of, of the entire river. And then any anywhere that he was too far for him to have a specific wife, he would trade off daughters to have in in um, you know leadership of the tribes of of that he dealt with. And then when the white settlers came or the western western and habitation began to occur, again, he traded off all of his daughters to all the most powerful fur companies and trading companies. And I would love to see like you know, they show the lineage of Genghis Khan and, and his his how you know a certain amount of all Asian population is related to Genghis Khan. I would love to see the lineage of King Kong Kali and, and where his right. genetics now, are spread from where now it's not too far from there is a place called Deer Island. And that that's on the yeah. Oregon yeah. side across from right. the, the Columbia there. And then of course the nuclear reactor right. was up there. Yep. Uh yep. Ma- Mamalus uh was brought to my attention as being a very mysterious place by um, yep. a guy named Henry Franzoni. I don't know if you've met Henry at all, but it's certainly I have it. No. Be an, an interesting conversation. He's a scientist that works yeah. with Native Americans up there on the Columbia River Gorge and uh, writes about place names as being uh, significant spots to uh, go check out, in particular names like Devil's Creek or you know Windigo Mountain. Right. Or Deer Island like or Goat Island. Or... Right. There's, there's right. very... If, if you look at the picture that I sent you that I, that I marked as the pyramid ship marker, and I think that's called Martin's Island, if I remember correctly. One anomaly about Martin's Island is there's there's real no there's really no record of its of its um, construction as a as a development on the Columbia River, and it's and from what I can see, for as long as as there's been sanctioned development on the Columbia River, that type of development would would not be allowed. And so what you see on on that island is it's one shaped as a cardinally aligned pyramid. Two, it has in its uh, position of providence, or where you would see, you know, traditionally an all-seeing eye or something of that nature and symbol. It has a ship, ship, a uh, deep ship parking spot that's large enough for a fleet of ocean-going vessels, and it sits right there at the headwaters of. Uh, it's right there in Woodland, Washington, the headwater or the where the the mouth of the Lewis, where it spills into the Columbia. And uh, I truly believe it's a, it's a marker on the on the water that's been, been left there to mark and designate specifically the pyramid structures, and specifically Tum Tum, the the point of the triangular pyramid shaped ship marker points directly, exactly to the tip of Tum Tum, and so directly across the river from that is Deer Island and Goat Island. And so I always make the joke that that's the world's first stop and go mini mart, and that's where <laughs> you, that's where you would pull up and you would fill your ships with you would you would deploy your long boats of slaves and mercury up to the extraction site. You would load up on the the sturgeon and the salmon and the freshest water on the planet and the the unexplainable uh, mm-hmm. sustainable herd of of deer on Deer Island and the unexplainable sustainable goat herd mm-hmm. on Goat Island. And, 
and you would load your boats to the rim and you would send off your workers and bam, bam, you're, you're off and go minute mark style. So I, I've coined that, that island and, and goat island and uh, deer island right there as, as the world's first stop and go. So I, I, I truly believe it's a marker and, and a safe haven for ships. And yeah, I mean, you can't help but think about, you, you can't help but think about uh, Oak Island when you're talking about some of these uh, yeah. places in the Columbia, yeah. and of There's course, what are they correlation. what are they finding in Oak Island is absolutely amazing. Being a truck driver yeah. driving up down I five from Oregon to Washington, I know exactly uh, what you're talking about because as you're driving south, mainly south to Oregon, off to your right in the Columbia, you'll see this island. And then all of a sudden, they yeah, still you know, use it. All the boats it as, hang out and party. Where all the boats hang out and party, right there. Right, right. It's an old. It looks like yeah. a mooring spot that uh, is. It natural. is. It, it, yeah. and, let's, and, and let's think about the word mooring as being okay. related to the more global civilization and why and why that word is what it is. But yes, it is. It is a. It is a mooring spot, um, safe harbor, and it's pyramid mm-hmm. shaped, and it's it's pointing towards Tum Tum Mountain, and it's it's uh, specifically I. I believe a, a ship marker, you know, it's, it's like you say, you watch, you watch the history channel and we all do, and mm-hmm. we all watch ancient aliens and we all watch Oak Island and we watch the, the new gold show, right? You can, you can see specifically correlations in, in, in those, in those shows, those structures and, and that area. Longview is exactly like the, the town in Michigan that the, this last History Channel gold show has been looking for the, the you know, the gold from the, the Civil War that was taken mm-hmm. from the Confederates and what happened to it. You know, that, that's, that's it's speculation purely, but it, it, it could be specifically the same orders that these men in Longview are connected to and where the private funding that created a southern mm-hmm. style city in the middle of the Northwest by a bunch of men that wanted to put in ritualistic geometry and in a uh, reverence to the sun and Egyptian mysticism and, and, and how it relates to, to the whole country and the history, you know, the, these orders and, and the, the the vision that they specifically cause for change that they control is, is amazing. When we look at our history, right. We look and see that it's, it's the same side, it's different sides of the same group causing conflicts to Mm -hmm. change things to their will. It's not, it's not, hey, this side's against this side for this specific reason. It's if we have a conflict, we can make change. So right. there's, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things in our history, I think, that are, you know, a lot deeper than the, mm-hmm. than the surface uh, we see. No, and driving through that area, uh, I've been to uh, towns of like Cougar, Washington. I've been to uh, oh, yeah. Ape Cave. Uh, I've been to Ape Canyon. Yeah. Yet, but there is a very... Um, awe-inspiring and almost eerie feeling to that area. I don't know if you have heard that before, but there's there's been oh, at least and you feel it. It's you feel do. It. It's a feeling. Yeah, I mean you're yeah. completely enclosed by beautiful mountain ridges. It's, it, it, it's most... a feeling that if you elongated your hit head, you would feel a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I'll think about doing that next for my next road trip. But yeah, a little there's... late, man. You gotta yeah. do that. <laughs> I know that there's been some people that have left that area for no reason. Um, one of them was a gal I met in Oregon who went up there and uh, she said, I've been camping a million other places, but whatever was going on there. And she had a little bit of the psychic woo woo going on herself, but she said there was sure, something sure. going on around Yakult that was so off putting yeah. that um, I had it, to go. It's and the it, energy, it's the energy left, left back from the mercury. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. it, it is. I mean, mm-hmm. it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very uh, off put that they that, that, that didn't do any scientific investigation into the medical anomalies that have occurred in that specific area. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Wouldn't, but, would, but they, wouldn't they still be going on the deaths? I mean, there would be groundwater. Well, there's, there's still there now. Now that's true, and 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 you can Google it and check it out for yourself, or your listeners can. You can you can Google the the medical anomalies that are related to that area, and it's still there's still anomalous medical activity going on in that area. Specifically, there is also that you know that area has the highest concentration of of those other paranormal. Uh, reports as well, the Sasquatch or the aliens or ghosts, and 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 that's historical in that area too. It goes back to, you know, you can uh, 
the same way you can Google medical anomalies, you can medical ghost stories of Yakel. And, and you'll see that there's something going on there that's making people either see things in, in, in a way that's allowing their perception to see interdimensional connections that they wouldn't mm-hmm. other be, otherwise be able to see, or there's a poisoning that, that's causing a psychosis mm-hmm. that's, that's contributing to that. And I'm not saying that it's either or that it's not both. So it's it's there there's definitely something going on. The Native Americans wouldn't have named it Yakult, right? They wouldn't right. have, so, they wouldn't have mean, named it m- that m- mercury if it wasn't poison. historical. Right. Yeah, yeah mercury so poisoning. So how do you explain how like do you the... explain mercury poisoning? Yeah, it is as a demon that comes and takes a healthy man in the night for no reason. You're healthy yeah. one day, mercury poisons and dead the next. Yeah. With yeah. for no reason. I mean you can trace I, I please, I please, uh, please have your audience please Google Tom Tom Mountain and, and then switch to the topography and then look at the stream that comes out of the back of Tom Tom Mountain and flows into Yakult, Washington. It literally flows directly into downtown. So it- if if there's not a connection to uh, to heavy metal processing at that site and it being a wastewater channel that flows directly into the cursed area of the Yakel, I would be highly surprised that that's just a coincidence. Right now, the uh, does that flow in directly to the Lewis River as well from Yakel? The Yakel. Uh, little that little stream uh, uh gosh i you know i i'm not really i haven't really traced where it goes after it goes to yakult i know it goes in in a lot of the water in that area is specifically strange anyway because it's the entire from the lewis to the columbia and all the way around the whole area is, is surrounded by waterways which is odd because it's inland right you know you're talking what, 70 miles inland, and then there's an island in the middle of, 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 of the, the section of Portland to Longview and mm-hmm. around to Mount St. Helens and, and that area. I mean, that's, it's just an oddity. It just doesn't, you know. Right. You can, you can traverse the whole thing by water in the, in the center of the, the land mass. It's very odd. If, if you, one thing that I've, that I've done is if you go around that area from, from say Martin's Island or the, the pyramid ship marker, I say is the first port. Then you go down to, there's an area just uh, south of Woodland where you can see, you know, the, the way the water is widened in that area. And it looks like it was another port. And then you go down to Vancouver uh, Lake and it has that island inside of the lake and it sits on the corner right across from Portland and it appears to be another port. And then you get around the corner to, to Camas and um, Lake Lacamas and you can see that the, um, that the timber company that, that built the timber mill there uh, closed it off from being a lake, which used to be a port. And then you get around to where the Bridge of the Gods used to give migration, controlled migration across the river into that specific area. And then you get going on to to or before that into to the big big Beacon Rock and or is that the name of that rock that's there on the river? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Then 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 the Bridge of the Gods and then the then around to where Stabler is. You can see all of those areas, in my opinion, are ancient ports and they're part of the connected sites that make up the the connected Tom Tom Silver Star Mountain uh, site area that's that's mm-hmm. right there in Southwest Washington. It's all fascinating. You have to be in the middle of some projects to, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, expose the truth on some of this stuff. So, what do you have in the works that uh, people can count on? Well, you know, one thing I, I, I'll say, and I, you know, I should say that I, I, it's, you know, I haven't come up with all of these things myself. I, I definitely identified Tum Tum, the Seal and Longview, the Silver Star, the other sites that are there. But, but I've, I've worked a lot with um, social media these days is great, right? You can, you can see people like Julie Ryder in, in the Montana Megalith in, in Montana. And I have a friend, Dwayne Seeler, who, who's identified uh, sites in, in Idaho that are astonishing. I mean, absolute uh, I don't want to keep using the word perfect, but absolute geometric 
perfection to uh, statues and busts of Akhenaten and uh, other uh, geometry that's that's just astounding. That you know, there's there was an article in the in the late 1800s, and it was called "The Altars of Coeur d'Alene. And it was it was really um, really eloquently writ uh, article uh, trying to get the people if you've made it I believe it was published in the Oregonian or whatever the the name of the first Portland paper was and it was it was trying to get the people of of the area that had had made it out this far west to come and check out the ancient altars of the Coeur d'Alene area and in the article it talked about six marble altars just outside of the Coeur d'Alene Lake and and in this um, in this uh, area of, of ancient ancient sites and and so um, my friend Dwayne was was able to to do a lot of research on that specific site and um, you know I can't give away all Dwayne's research but together we we were able to substantiate the geometry of the area was 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 being called after a very specific shape let's just use the word square which is not the right word but let's just say it was square mountain right and so when Dwayne had showed me square mountain that has been that had been designated by the natives and then by the jesuits to be a sacred place as soon as i saw the geometry i then showed Dwayne that yeah man this isn't just square it actually holds a very specific geometry of a very specific individual in akhenaten all the way to the bust and since we've we've been able to find multiple locations showing like the, the Badlands Guardian, showing the specific geometry of Nefertiti, uh, areas in Montana that are holding geoglyph specific geometry of uh, Sumer Sumerian kings, uh, Sargon to be specific. Um, so we're finding a lot of very specific, what are called geoglyphs or terraformed areas that are holding very specific geometry in North America that there's no historical record of. So it's 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 all very perplexing and and it is all I would leave it up to the listener to form their own opinions mm -hmm. and do their own research. But there is definitely a lot of anomalies that seem to hold more than just coincidence mm -hmm. involved in these sites. No, I mean it, really people just take a look at uh Tum Tum Mountain, take a look at the Badlands Guardian and walk away from that as a skeptic that something else is going on here, especially if if LIDAR is correct about the mountain itself and the work that Marcia has done. Um, I, and then looking back at what Marcia did on ancient aliens with the renderings of it being kind of a Mesoamerican profile, the face does not look like that at all. The face looks very Egyptian, and you can't help but think of some hieroglyph in Giza when you look at it. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's very specifically the geometry of Nefertiti. You, okay. you, can, you can look at um, the, the Nefertiti bust, and then, you know, I sent you the overlays, and, and you can overlay, and it is point-to-point -point specific congruency. So it's, it's you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's either that the Nefertiti lineage is holding a prior geometric-specific relationship to the bust of Nefertiti itself that goes to, say, a non-specific person like Nefertiti looks like Nefertiti because the Nefertiti before her looked like Nefertiti mm -hmm. or or it is specifically to the geometry of specifically Nefertiti so it, it's and, and you know what I can show you um, on the Oregon coast uh, we I can show you that exact same geometry uh, just just almost the length of the entire Oregon coast uh, also at uh, Kuchaman Rock up on Mount Rainier. All three, the Badlands, the Rock, and on the ocean, they all hold exactly the same point-to-point -point, uh, Nefertiti-specific ge geometric relationship. So I just can't see that it's it's happenstance or coincidence that that specific points hold specific gravity at specific locations. So to me, that's you know, one plus one plus one usually equals three, or at least in their code, it does. <laughs> right, yeah, three is a, a sacred and important number. <laughs> so, Sean, uh, again, the invite stands on March 7th from, well, all day probably on March 7th at the Manresa Castle. I'll be up there. We've talked again, we've spoken again about uh, Marcia K. Moore, your colleague, who will be speaking at the Manresa Castle in Port Townsend, Washington. 
we will be there. Uh, you can book a room now at Manresa Castle. I'd love to see you pop in, Sean, and uh, kick yeah. it with us and uh, have people meet you because you have, uh, I feel like you're the missing puzzle piece uh, that uh, we've all been waiting for uh, in regards to what uh, what we kind of suspected waited in areas like Yakult and Cougar and 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 Longview. So yeah, I, uh, it's been my pleasure talking to you. Again, I I would love to meet those people, and I, and I do. I, I would also employ the, those people to check out people like Julie Ryder, Dwayne Sealer, Nick Barger, people on the internet that on Facebook and and different places that that are um, seeing these things and mm -hmm. and. Uh, identifying these sites and, and trying to substantiate them. And, you know, people like Nick, Nick has this ability to envision uh, these geoglyphs and then um, they're there, you know, and they hold very specific uh, geometry and it's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing gift. Um, people like Dwayne, you know, Dwayne understands, Dwayne Sealer understands the way the interconnected system works that that's linking these sites together how the waterways and the headwaters and the way that the water is flowing to the ocean and different different things that that you you've heard me mention in this in this podcast um i don't want it all to for people to think that you know this is all just 100 percent me these days I'm, I'm able to get online look at things of at anything right and so there's been a ton of people robert um homeric i don't want to butcher robert's last name but robert's done a ton of work on the vitruvian code of washington dc and, and it's allowed me robert was the first one that told me hey sean you need to get a superimpose app you can't believe what you'll figure out and so there's there's a ton of people that that are you know helping me and uh working with me and and uh it's been great to to meet these people and mm -hmm. see other people with like vision. So and and to meet you and and hopefully yeah. collaborate in the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and it sounds like literally, and that's that's a really, <laughs> yeah. that's a that's an astounding place to be. And uh, you know, it makes uh, the next forty or fifty years of uh, our life, uh, forty if we're lucky, I guess, to really go for it. And it's people like you that inspire the young. Indiana Jones that's uh, listening to this right now and to get online and do their homework and take a road trip to some of the spots we mentioned. Uh, we got a, a, a summer coming up here that's sure. meant for road trips, although I'd suggest going out in the fall after all the kids are back in school and, and check out right. some of these spots. And um, anyway, Sean, it's been my, go ahead. I would highly suggest to to your listeners too to if you can't get out, use the satellite maps. The satellite maps and the imagery these days that we have access to is, is astounding. The different layers and and topographic functions, and mm -hmm. it's it's amazing what you're able to find with the filters that are just available on your smartphone. Right, right, right. And the added bonus, of course, uh, not to disagree with you at all about that, Sean, but. Uh, you find out things when you're in front of these places on your own two feet, spending your own dollar. Because oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. If you can get yeah. out, if you right. can, if you, you can look at it, That's right? Because saying. there's synchronicity waiting for when you do this kind of stuff. And I've spoken about that before, but your intention starts to be placed. And this is going to be a little bit woo out of the box for some people, but just plan to go on these kind of adventures and road trips because synchronicity will kick in and you will start to put the dots together yourself. Some of the stuff you just cannot do from the comfort of your computer desk. You just, you can't oh, I, appreciate I, I the, the gravity of it. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. Okay, man. It's been a great, it's been a great time talking yeah. with you and I look forward to meeting you in person and, and I hope I can make it to your event on the 7th. I will, I will, I'll try. Hey, Sean. Cool, man. Nice to meet you, man. Have okay. a good night, and uh, I'll talk to you hopefully soon. Okay, for sure. All you right. take care. Bye. All right, folks. Now you have a field trip. You can plan it now. It's not hard to find these places. Uh, roll some video and send it to me at strangebrowradio at gmail.com. If you've got a story uh, of similar nature from that area, I would love to talk to you. I would call that area Skin Twin. There is uh, enough unusual stories there, not to even depart from uh, the amount of uh, supernatural incidents uh, reported outside of Mount Tum Tum 
near the Lewis River, including the Germer Brothers story, which was right there, uh, still very active. And so uh, a lot of anecdotal stuff, too, with friends from that area, it being a very strange, highly charged area. And now maybe we know why. So check that out. Also, if you want to go to a really cool place outside of Longview, you go to the little town of Kelso, Washington, north-south I-5 corridor along the north-south portion of the Columbia River Gorge. And facing is a really cool three-story hotel, restaurant, and bar. It's called McMinimins, and it is fantastic. You can't miss it. It's right there in Kelso on the Columbia River Gorge. And I think there's like two or three hidden rooms, hallways, just like you would experience at a speakeasy. They've got the hotel rooms all named after people of note, including one of them, uh, the D.B. Cooper room. So, yeah, there's check that out, McMinimins along the uh, Columbia River Gorge if you want to go have a super-duper uh, adventure. All right, we have some events coming up, including... Our event on March 7th, that is going to be from 6 to 9 with Marcia K. Moore. You won't want to miss this one. It's going to be our podcast alive. It's at Manresa Castle in Port Townsend, Washington. Also a place that you want to book a room at. We Each time we're there, we have uh, some incredible things happen live on stage. And if you want the content, if you want to see what's happening, you have to subscribe. And that's where Patreon comes in. So... Membership has its privileges, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can support the show that way, which is always helpful, that you can get through the website at strangebrowradio.com. You can go straight to the Patreon page and join up uh, for as little as $3. And there you'll get added bonus content. Also, the merchandise. That's another way to help the show. Um, the first hoodies and T-shirts and coffee mugs and socks went out to listeners of the show. And I must say the quality looks great, and I made sure that uh, I didn't get any cheapo things put up online there. So you can get that at strangebowradio.com. Hey, if you want to be a guest and you have an interesting, mysterious story to tell, anything that you think would maybe be you know, categorized as far as fringe or taboo, cryptids, ghost, Sasquatch, of course, UFOs, time travel... Anything within that realm. Hey, scoot on over. Grab a seat here at the Strange Bell Radio bar. And I'll pour you a tall one and we can talk. So I've got some emails that have come in and uh, don't quite have the permission yet to read them on air. So as soon as I do, I will do that as well. And you can do that yourself. If you just want to shoot me an email with your story, feel free to do that at strangebowradio at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and of course, I will see you in the trees.